Hi guys, welcome to my session on Coffee with Prab. And today podcast we're going to cover a domain two asset security. Welcome to this short podcast of CISSP Masterclass, and thanks for sharing a great response on my domain one, which motivate me to make another podcast. So today we're going to deep dive into domain two asset security, which is also called as a heartbeat of protecting what truly matters. You know your information and assets. So stay tuned because we'll cover everything from data classification to media sanitization with the real world example, CSSP insights, even some critical security tips which help you to clear the certification in a first attempt. So let's jump in. So first part in this domain two, which is called asset security, one thing that for sure is this is a very very important domain. If you really want to pass this exam, you need to have a very good understanding of domain two. So domain two actually start with assets. Now assets comes in two flavors. Okay, assets are two type. One is called as a tangible asset, and one is called as a intangible asset. Tangible assets are the things that you can touch, like server, laptop, endless piles of documents, and all that. And uh, intangible assets think of a data. Okay, intellectual property. Okay, and that million dollar software, your softwares, your company is running on, that is called intangible. So in layman term, you can say that something which can physically touch, that's a tangible, and your files, logical files in the systems, the data is called as intangible. Now one important pointer that you have to remember, if you want to protect assets, you need to first classify the data or classify the assets. Data is also part of assets. Okay, and if you want to classify, you should know the value of the assets. Okay. So quick CISSP takeaway: whether it's a tangible or intangible, you need to classify it. You need to protect it. You need to manage it like your life depend on it. Okay, and it it becomes sometime it does. So that's a very important part. So now now you decided that you have a multiple assets. It's same like you know you go to airport, you carry your baggage. Other passenger also carrying a baggage. But now your baggage has a glass items. Your bag your bag has a fragile items. So when your bag has a fragile items, how can you tell the airline? So you have to tell them. So they will basically label, they will label the sticker on the bag. It's a fragile. So they have a population of bags, but they understood from the label we have to take care of these bags. So same thing when you want to protect any assets, you cannot give same level of value to all the assets, right? So when you're doing a valuation, valuation is also two type: qualitative and quantitative. Qualitative is like you know reputation value, you know. Not a monetary, but reputation value is called as a qualitative emotions. This is very important for me to protect. And a quantitative is basically called as a mon- monetary benefit. So when you classifying the data, ultimate goal of classifying is to protect the asset with appropriate level of security because it is not possible for me to give attention to all the asset with the same level of controls. Now the question is why we classify? Because as I said, not all data is created equal. And uh, think of it's like your wardrobe, right? Your almira. So some outfits are for public view and others are private and few are top secret like those embarrassing sweet pants. So in a commercial world classification levels are the same. So we have a confidential, we have a private, we have a sensitive, we have public. Let me give an example. So actually in CISSP we have a two type of classification label. One is commercial, one is called military. So first I'm going to discuss about commercial. So in commercial we have a confidential if it's it's a very harmful if it leak it like it it impact the business strategy so most of the trade secrets we keep in the confidential label then we have a private which includes the pi personal information like employee records sensitive which is a restricted access needed like financial data and public is anyone can see it so no stress there on the other side when you join any military and all that so military has a different type of classification like they have a top secret secret confidential sensitive but unclassified and unclassified so cssp tip here is you should know why you know why behind this classification because the exam basically loves testing your understanding on purpose value and protection level okay remember that so ultimate goal of classifying the asset so that asset receive the appropriate level of protection that's a very important part okay okay so now the next part is privacy before i jump into the privacy i want to discuss one thin line difference between the privacy and secrecy privacy is a state of information deal with individual and secrecy is a state of information deal with enterprise that's why you never heard about the no, top privacy low privacy we say always say top secret secret and all that now when it comes to the privacy part one of the regulation that you must must know from the exam point of view is gdpr 
GDPR, yeah. So General Data Protection Regulation. It is a privacy law from the European Union and it is applicable for EU resident, which include the citizen. So if I'm doing a business in Europe and uh, if I'm collecting any data of European, whether European resident or citizen, so my company has to subject to comply with GDPR. Always remember, okay, so GDPR is not only limited to GDP Europe citizen, it is applicable for Europe resident. Remember that resident, resident includes citizen, PR holder and everything. Second, most important part when you're preparing for this exam, remember that in GDPR, you have to report the breach in 72 hours, 72 hours, okay. Another important thing you need to know in GDPR that GDPR consider human privacy as a individual right. Human privacy is an individual right in Europe. Another important thing you need to know from GDPR point of view is in GDPR, we have a three roles, data controller, data processor and data subject. Let me explain with the example. So I go to the bank, I shared my data and other some personal, uh, like, you know, personal ID and all that. So I'm a data subject. My identification is my data subject. Now bank is collecting my data. They, they, they're using a cloud to hold my store, my data. So in this case, bank is legally accountable for my data. So they are the data controller and provider is the one who hold my data. So provider is basically the one which is process the data. We, we can have a controller processor within the company. So one thing you need to remember is controller is the one who ultimately accountable, processor is the one who is responsible. Now another important thing in GDPR you need to remember is right to forgotten or right to forgot. It means you have to, if anyone requesting to delete the data, it must be deleted in 30 days. Now if any company is a uh, need to follow GDPR, he has to comply with seven principles. So first principle is called as a lawfulness, fairness, transparency. Okay. Like, you know, as a company, I'm, I'm sharing the complete information, why I'm collecting, how I'm collecting and everything. Second is purpose limitation, why I'm collecting a data, like I'm collecting data for webinar. Then we have a data minimization that I'm only collecting email ID. Okay. Then accuracy, storage limitation, integrity, confidentiality and accountability. So, if I talk about CSSP inside, these principles are not just theoretical, but they may be backbone of real world compliance. So, you know, you have to understand all these seven principles clearly. One important thing I want to tell you is uh, a cheat sheet or you can say important pointer is data minimization is a very important because more you collect, more accountability comes to you. Okay, so more you collect, more accountability comes to you. So better is collect the limited data. Now, what happened is when we talking about GDPR perspective, so there's always a relation between data transfer from EU to US. Now I have a company in US and they want to collect the data from the European. So nowadays what happened, there's a one framework was introduced, which is an agreement between the EU and US, which is called as a DPF, data privacy framework. And you know, the cross border data transfer. Now it is a hot topic. So US and EU data privacy framework replace the previous privacy shield, which ensure the data flow securely between US and EU. So US company can certify the compliance with framework to legally process the EU data. And the key feature is strong privacy standards aligned with GDPR and independent dispute resolutions. Why it is better? Because this framework smooth out the legal hurdles of transferring personal data while protecting the individual right. So CSSP tip here is understand the cross border data agreement is also vital for protecting a data sovereignty and ensure the compliance. Another important thing in GDPR, you need to understand we have a two amendments, two amendments. Okay. When you're de dealing with cross border data transfer, if you're sending data outside of EU, two rules are applicable. One is called BCR binding corporate rule. And second is standard contractual clause SCC. How to remember BCR, which is called binding corporate rule is applicable within a same company, within a same company. Example, like I am running a company in India, but head office is basically in EU. So they're pulling a data to India for processing and all that. So in that case, BCR will be applicable, binding corporate rule. But I am the third party company who's MSSP and all that, who collecting a data. So in that case, the applicable is SCC, standard contractual clause. How to remember between the two companies is a contract, so standard contractual clause. So two different, two different companies we have, then SCC. And if the same company we have branch, which is called BCR. Another important thing in domain two, we talk about here is data sovereignty. So data flow, the land of the land where it store. So thanks to data sovereignty, that's why data residency policy matter and deciding where business store their data. 
and don't forget data retention is also very important so you have to create a retention policy to keep the data intact for a right amount of time because more data you retain more accountability comes to you and that basically lead to the cost so one important pointer is it is always good to create a data retention policy okay so you can retain the data for a particular time because more data you retain more accountability comes to you is it clear so for long term preservation archiving comes in handy but what about when it come time to say goodbye to the old data and this is where the media sanitization comes into the picture so media sanitization is a goodbye process so when data is no longer needed how do you make sure it truly gone so we use different technique the first is called clearing a simple deletion you know least secure just overwriting second is called as a purging where we erase data through the using a tool like dban or we using a degausser third is called as a destruction where we physically destroy the data one of the most effective technique to destroy the data is physical destruction okay then we have a crypto shedding so if any topic talking about how to destroy data in the cloud the answer is crypto shedding so exam might throw terms like data remnants so data which is left after deletion that is called data remnants so data remnants is refer to a trace of data left after attempt to erase it so choose your media sanitization properly okay now when you talking about data states so we have a different type of data states we have a data at rest data in transit and data in use so even in the states we basically have a different type of controls so first we discuss about data at rest in data at rest remember two solutions tpm and sed tpm stand for trusted platform module which store encryption keys okay it's very important for you to know how tpm work tpm is for endpoint and if you're looking for connecting multiple servers enterprise then we use hsm hardware security modules and second is called as a sed which is called as a self encrypting disk which automatically encrypt the data now when it come to data in use data in use we have a masking so we have a static masking we have a dynamic masking and uh, we have a tokenization very very important you should know that tokenization is a concept where we replace the data sensitive data with some other value that is called as a tokenization along with that static is just like you know uh, using a random data for testing the application so that is called a static masking dynamic masking is further is called as a anonymization and pseudonymization one thing you need to remember is pseudonymization is a way to protect the data in gdpr it is just like you know replacing your name with some other id okay so that is called as a pseudonymization and one more example of dynamic mask dynamic masking is that uh, you know when you call uh, uber and all that then then they mask your number right so that is another example now when it comes to data in transit remember two type of encryption is very important link encryption and end to end link is more secure because it is encrypting a data along with header so your ipsec transport mode and tunnel mode is a example of link encryption and end to end encryption and they work so link encryption work on layer 2 end to end work on application layer now we decided that we need to implement the controls so we refer some baseline controls to implement the controls but for that first we have to do scoping and tailoring so i decided i want to use iso or i i decided i have to use nist but in nist i have to i have to select wireless control so i am selecting wireless only that's called scoping so choosing a control that matter to your environment tailoring is customizing the thing okay i selected the authentication encryption of wireless so i mean i'm modifying that like aes authentication sorry aes encryption and chap authentication so that is called as a tailoring so selection of a control is scoping but selected control modify slightly to meet a business objective that is called as a tailoring when you implementing control you use a one process which is called pdca plan do check act so during a planning we scope and classify the asset during a do we implement and tailor the controls during a check we test the control and act as fix any gap so always sanitize old media before disposal to prevent the data breach another important thing in the domain to we called as a data life cycle so in data life cycle we have a steps like create store use share archive and destroy it is not a cycle okay so that something is there so so whether when you talking about data classifications and all that this is very important because that is a important framework for the entire asset management Okay so that's a very important part okay so this is all from my side do let me know how do you find this podcast and do let me know shall i go for the another podcast of domain 3 in the comments okay thank you so much good day bye